Welcome to 52 Weeks in the Word. I'm your host, Trillia Nubo, and I'm joined here today by my friend, Courtney Doctor. Courtney is the author of several Bible studies, including Steadfast, a devotional Bible study on the book of James. James is a tough book. Am I right, Courtney? James is a tough <laughs> book. You are right, Trillia. You are right. He- he doesn't mince words. Um, I had the joy of, yeah, he just goes straight for the heart. I had the joy of writing a kid's book called The Big Wide Welcome, and it focuses on James 2 and the sin of partiality or favoritism. I absolutely loved trying to make it into a story and helping little hearts understand it. Now, of course, James is for big hearts too, and I want us to, to get into some of the things that he challenges us to do and think and be. Um, so what are, and, and so I'm going to ask a, maybe a strange question. Is there anything surprising, like a surprising truth in this book? And how might we apply it? Well, I think if you're reading through the Bible, like say through 52 weeks, right? And you are working your way through different books of the Bible. When you hit James, it is a little surprising because you expect it to be like some of the other letters that you've read, some of the letters that Paul's written or Peter or or John. And you get to James and it's really not like that. It reads very differently. And part of what makes it read different so in the entire book, it has 108 verses and f- at least 50 of those verses are commands, meaning they're telling us what to do. And it's just, it's a little, it's a little shocking because so many of the other letters in the New Testament are explaining how we get saved or the grace of God. And this one It seems to be lacking some of those things, but what we have to realize when we come to the book of James is that it is much closer. If we talk about genre or category of literature, the book of James is much closer to what we call wisdom literature or the Proverbs than it is to an epistle, even though it was written by a man and it's in the New Testament. And so what James is saying, and I think if you don't hear anything else on this podcast, hear this. James is not telling us how to become a Christian. James is telling us how to live if we are a Christian. And that's all the difference in the world. So he just comes at us, like you've already alluded to, Trillia, he comes after all these different aspects of our lives. I mean, he messes with us in really good ways, but we have to remember the whole time, he is not saying, if you can live like this, then you could be a Christian. He is saying, none of us, even with the indwelling Holy Spirit, it's hard to live like this. But what he is saying is this is what the life of a faithful follower of Jesus is going to look more and more and more like. And he would know because he, if you guys haven't talked about this, he was the half brother of Jesus himself. Um, They both had Mary for their mother. And And so here's a man who we see in the New Testament or early in the Gospels that he didn't follow Jesus. And and then we see this completely transformed, radical change in his life that he is saying can be yours, too, um, as you get to know the living Christ. Amen. I love that you emphasize that James is not telling us how to become a Christian, but we're a Christian. Okay, here's how you live. And so what, one of the things that just jumped out at me as you were saying that is faith without works is dead. And so some people kind of get stuck on that. And I've heard it, and I bet you can explain it even better, but I've heard it kind of explained as um, proof of faith. In other words, we have the faith, and if we already believe and work, it's going to be the proof that we have been saved. So our faith without works faith without works is dead. In other words, we're saved and our works show our salvation. Now, how would you explain that? No, that was beautiful, Trillia. That's exactly it. I think so. We come across this this verse in James 2, where he literally says, faith without works is dead. Well, 
the rest of the Bible screams that we are saved by faith alone, right? It is it is something that we pr- use that phrase by faith alone to profess our faith that we're saved by no good works of our own. Well, the rest of the New Testament is so clear that we are saved by faith alone. It's something that we profess, we cling to, we know that we are not saved by our own works, by our own righteousness. We are saved by faith in Christ who did the good works and is righteous. And so that's given to us. And so when we come to James and he says that a person is not saved by faith alone, but by works, we have to understand that Paul, so not James, but Paul, when he's writing about faith and works and what their relationship is, he is answering the question, how does a person get right with God? How's a person saved? And the answer is by faith alone and not by works. He says it in Ephesians. He says it in Romans. We are saved by faith alone. James is not answering that question. James is answering the question, how does a person know that they're right with God? And so Paul's talking about pre-salvation works, things that we might try to do to be saved. And we have to say there's no such thing. I, I heard one scholar say, we add nothing to our salvation except the sin that necessitates it. <laughs> I thought that is so true. So James is not talking about works that are pre-salvation. He's talking about things that we do after salvation, post-salvation. And his answer, James, is that the works in your life, the good works that you do, the fruit that you bear in, internally and externally, those things, for that fruit or those works, they actually bear testimony to a living faith. They prove, like you were saying, Trillia, they prove or they justify that your faith is real. And James goes on to use the example of Abraham, who Paul uses the example of Abraham to say, see, he was saved by faith alone. You know, he believed and it was credited to him as righteousness. And then James is like, look at Abraham. His works proved that he had faith. And they're talking about two different places in Genesis. Paul's talking about Genesis 15. James is talking about Genesis 22, many years later, when he began to sacrifice his son Isaac on the altar. And God said, you know, now I know, right? Like now I know. And so our works, I think the point for us is we are supposed to rest in the fact that we do nothing to earn our salvation, but then we are supposed to honestly look at our lives and say, do I bear the fruit of salvation in me? Do I see the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faith? You know, do I see that in me? And do I see these good works that James is talking about? Is bias and prejudice decreasing in my life? Are my words more and more um, God honoring? Am I using my money? Do I care for the, the poor and the marginalized more than I did? I mean, these are the things that James is just going to come at us with that the life of a believer looks like this. And it's going to rule over everything, your thoughts, your speech, your money, your pride, your temptations. Um, And so James really helps us see how the life of a believer is lived in a way that is faithful and true. Amen. Gosh. And you know what's okay. There's two things real quick. One, as you were talking and I was thinking, oh, what a kindness to God that he doesn't hide, um, you know, he's, he's not telling us, he's not hiding what pleases him and how, how we can be more like Christ. He reveals and helps us. And it's his kindness that leads us to repentance. And so when we see the book of James and we're studying and reading through it, and and if we're convicted, if there's something we're like, ouch, it's his kindness. We can confess it and receive his grace and change. What a good thing. What a good, kind God. And then as you were talking, I was thinking about how wonderful, it was that you've done what I have um, prayed people would do as they're reading through the Bible. If you are using 52 weeks in the word, you will see throughout that book that I am connecting the dots between Old Testament and New Testament and how it all kind of works together. And you kind of just, you just did that when we're talking about Paul and James and Genesis and, and, I just find it so wonderful that as we read Genesis through Revelation, we can see this storyline of the scripture. And we also, um, it, it, it connects. We can we can understand the word um, as we're reading, even in James, that, oh, 
what we're reading in James connects to what Paul was writing about, which connects to the beginning. (laughs) And so, amen. So anyways, I'm just, it was just so encouraging. So thank you. I hope we all have a new vision for the book of James as we continue to read it. You're probably done since it's a short book, but um, it's, it's just, it's so good. So rich. All right. I want to pray for us. I want to pray for us. Lord, thank you for the book of James. God, thank you that it, you saw to it that these words would be written for us to understand um, your word and understand what it's like to live for your glory. Lord, and if you uh, prick our hearts or bring conviction, we can know that it is for our good and your glory. So Lord, thank you. Lord, if there's anyone who is listening who has ever read this book and maybe they they didn't know how to read it, I pray that they have been encouraged and enlightened, Lord. But Lord, if there's conviction, I pray that they would repent. You say, if we confess our sin, you are faithful and just to forgive us and to purify us. So God, I pray that as we read and confess and grow in our likeness of Christ, God, that um, we would turn from our sin, that we would change and that we would grow, um, Lord, by your goodness and by your grace. So God, we are so grateful for you, for this word and for how you are strengthening our faith um, as we read. We love you and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Courtney. 